This could, could all go horribly wrong at any minute. And the rubber chicken says... <laughs> wow, listen to you. If I were the president of the United States, I would go to the Ukraine tomorrow and sit there on the border and dare those Russians to come in. Uh-huh. Because then there'd be no war. But what do I know? I'm just a rubber chicken and a peacemaker, too. And we'll discuss all forms of strategy at another time because we've got to get on with Rantcast 71 entitled California, Here I Come. Well, actually, California, here we are. We would have started it earlier, but I didn't, I didn't get it together. And so it would have been California here. So it's actually California, here we are. Uh, we, are we came from Reno last night, where I finally got a chance to gamble and was able to lose some money. So I feel a cleansing took place. I didn't lose a lot. Um, I was going to go back later, but I was tuckered out. Uh, uh, gave what, what, what many consider to be an operatic performance. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it was too much. It was a little over the top. I basically was exhausted uh, on some levels because I had flown the day before, which I say, um, I must say, I'm getting used to. Um, I was kind of surprised. I took a flight from Newark to San Francisco, uh, lucky enough to have one of those flatbed things, and it was, uh, and it was great, and nobody snapped. Nobody snapped on the plane. Everybody acted accordingly, um, like normal human beings on a plane trying to get from one part of the country to the other, the way people should act. And uh, it would seem to me after that flight, uh, I am of the mind that those who do snap on a plane because they're, they don't want to wear a mask on a plane or there's something has happened and they think that they need to open the door on a plane or they have to yell at uh, one of the uh, one of the folks who actually works on the plane, uh, you know that the the fact is is that person uh, should not be allowed to fly again, and there should be a no fly list for those people, so that they so that they're a they're not allowed back in, and it might be a deterrent to others because this bullshit's got to stop, and that's it, and it's that simple, and that's the way it's got to be done. But there are many people, apparently in Congress, who would be the ones who would have to vote on this. I gather, I gather. Um, have said that they wouldn't want to do it because then these people, how would we, you know, then that would make them seem like terrorists. Well, in a, in a fucking way, they are terrorists, you idiots, okay? And, and, and if you want to separate them from terrorists, here, here's the thing. What you do is you, on one side, you put uh, terrorists, political terrorists. On the other side, you put assholes, okay? That's not tough, is it? Fucking morons. But well, we're rolling along here. This is California at its best. I am not sure exactly where we are, but we're moving at uh, 3.2 miles an hour. It is uh, the President's Day weekend, and these people have got to get somewhere where apparently uh, they're giving away free shit. And that seems to be what's going on, because I can't think of another reason uh, what it is that they're out here to see. Um, but uh, I'm certainly missing whatever it is, and I'm, I'm a little saddened by that. So uh, here we are. We're on our way to Monterey, California, beautiful city by the uh, by the water. There, really stunning, really. And uh, can it, generally the seals are out. Sometimes uh, I think the walruses too. And uh, there's uh, it, it's really kind of an amazingly beautiful place. I couldn't live there for very long because it's, it's just too nice. You basically wake up every day and go, uh, "What am I going to do that's nicer than what I'm looking at?" Um, and it's a sleepy little town, um, and it's, I, I believe, it, and it, I know it's where uh, Steinbeck, I don't know if he's from there, is he? Uh, he's from, I think he's from Salinas. He may be from Salinas, possibly, uh, but he certainly, uh, he, he's honored there, and uh, I think he wrote, and I'm going to take a guess here, Cannery Row, uh, it was based on his time in uh, Monterey, when I guess they used to do canning. Uh, but not anymore. No need to can anything. We just eat it right off the beach. Just grab the fish and bite its head off. So uh, we're going to be there, and then we go on to Turlock. Very excited to go there because they've never heard of me, and I've never heard of them. It'll be a really great meeting. No one I know, no one I know, even the people who live in California, had heard of Turlock. I believe it's a village that sprouted up, and I believe that aliens have landed. And they said, we will call this Turlock. It is named after the planet that they're from, which is uh, three galaxies away, if I've got my 
numbers correct, and uh, the Turlokians have uh, won entertainment. Uh, they can't seem to get. Uh, they, they generally the audiences are smaller because uh, uh, they don't like to sit with each other. Uh, they're, they're, one group of Turlokians has to go to the theater, and the other group of Turlokians keeps guard to make sure that uh, there's no invasion by uh, those of us who are human. Um, so we'll see what, what that's like, and I'll report on that uh, next week. The interesting thing in uh, Reno is, uh, is starting to come back a little. We were out at the Grand Sierra Resort, which is kind of away from things. Um, I didn't get a chance to get into town because it was uh, actually 13 hours from the time I left home until I got there. And uh, so I, I wasn't up the next day going, well, let's race into town. I was uh, trying to work on the... On the um, <clears throat> The rant is due, and we had some, uh, you'll be hearing some great ones coming up this week. There were some really terrific ones. One in particular, uh, just to add to the story, is um, about a uh, helper monkey. And Kathleen Madigan and I, uh, years ago, um, while looking for something on television, uh, found a movie called uh, Monkey Shines, in which, uh, similar to this story in a way, um, this one is much funnier, uh, but but the, there were some l laughs in monkey shines. But it was a uh, uh, a monkey that did the bidding of his uh, paraplegic um, owner and a vicious monkey, and uh, went out and killed people uh, at the bidding of his owner. Uh, it's a it's a movie you should you know when, if you are bored shitless at this point in the, in the midst of all this. If, where there's a there's a yet another shutdown, uh, you, you might want to catch monkey shines. A fun one to show to the kids, especially if they're under the age of uh, seven. That ought to keep them up at night. <laughs> it's you no, know, it's a little a little unnerving, um, but it was uh, it, it was not for not for an adult. You'll get a kick out of it, and uh, and that's. Uh, just a little recommendation of uh, some <laughs> film to watch, but if that's exactly what the story that uh, that was related in the rent is due uh, last night. Also, a quick addition uh, to the to, to the cast in that movie I'd forgotten uh, were were two uh, two folks that I know, John Pankow, uh, who if you, if you may know from Mad About You uh, and a, a bunch of other films and. Stanley Tucci, who's got an upcoming thing on, uh, on CNN, traveling through Italy. I'm trying to get something on CNN, too, so uh, about traveling through the United States. Let's see if that happens. <laughs> but we'll try. Um, and, uh, but, but they're both in that, that movie, and, um, and, it's, and it really is kind of, it's, it's, worth, it's, it's, it's worth taking a look. Kathleen and I really enjoyed it and, uh, and watched it again a few years ago. So that's it from here. Uh, we are done. We uh, will go uh, on our way. Uh, and things are picking up now, so I'm kind of excited now that we found movement here in California. Uh, they've actually told some of the a, a big helicopter came over while we took a break, and it was yelling, move your ass, you fucks. And they did. It's really incredible the way they get traffic moving here. And uh, we're going through uh, the agricultural uh, end of um, California. And it's, uh, this is a beautiful spot, as you can see here, where I believe that gas station is shut down. And uh, in the midst of all of this, that, that you could have, a, it, maybe the former leader owned that gas station if he could bankrupt the casino, he could certainly bankrupt the gas station, but I, uh, we'll talk about that some other time, and uh, I'm sure the rubber chicken and I will be able to have a discussion, and I'll be back to you on that. Uh, meanwhile, next week, it's on to, um, let me figure it out, I'm going to do it on my own. Uh, we go to Napa, where I'll be spending part of this week in search of glug glug, some grapes I really like, and then we'll... Uh, head down to uh, um, Napa. Um, I'm going to get this correct. I'm going to do it if I have to break something, uh, break the map. Um, Napa, uh, then it ends in Redding, so there's something in between. But, uh, Lolita, uh, based on the book. 
uh, it's got, there's a casino there now. Uh, she, she moved there. She's, I think, 104 now. And, uh, but still, uh, you know, people who are 208 find her to be a young thing and very attractive. No, so it's uh, Napa, uh, Lolita, uh, casino there, I'll be gambling. So we'll pick that part of the story up. And then uh, Redding, California. And uh, looking forward to that. Uh, remember, get those rants in. Uh, tighten up, as they say, as Archie Bell and the Drill so wonderfully put it way back then. And I've repeated it again, because you can never, never say tighten up enough. And uh, I, 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 but um, if you can, if you live in those uh, or around those areas, or you're coming to the show, or you, you're not able to make the show, and and just want to hear uh, your uh, whatever you're pissed off about, or whatever your uh, whatever it is that you want to get, whatever information you want to get to me, and get out to the rest of the world, send them in. Uh, we're, they're getting better and better and better and better and better, and I'm happy to be doing them, and uh, we'll be having a lot of fun along the way, as long as the as long as the bus keeps moving, we will be having a good time. So we're going to stop off and pick up some vegetables and maybe a little, you know, some of that uh, marijuana that they're selling now by the side of the road in bushels. You may want to come out here and get yourself a grocery bag. It's, uh, I guess they're doing it by the pound. Uh, it's not as great as some of the other stuff that's being sold, but it's, it's not bad. And enjoy, enjoy, uh, enjoy whatever it is that you're enjoying, and I'll enjoy what I'm enjoying, and we'll... You know, and I can't wait to meet the Trilokians. Thanks for joining us on the road. If saving more and spending less is one of your top goals for 2022, Mint Mobile has you covered. Why are you still paying insane amounts of money every month for a wireless phone plan when switching to Mint Mobile is the easiest way to save? Mint Mobile is the first company to sell premium wireless services online only, which lets you maximize your savings with plans starting at just $15 a month. Mint Mobile makes it so you can eliminate the traditional costs of retail cellular plans, and then they pass those significant savings on to you. All their cellular plans come with unlimited talk and text, as well as high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. You can use any phone you have with any Mint Mobile plan and keep the same phone number and all your contacts. You can choose a monthly data plan that's right for you, and plans start as low as 15 bucks a month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, Go to mintmobile.com slash Lewis. That's mintmobile.com slash Lewis. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash Lewis. Today's episode is sponsored by Honey. We all shop online. We've all gotten to the point in checkout and we see that box that's asking us for that promo code. It sits there and taunts us. But thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Honey is the free browser extension that searches the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. Honey supports over 30,000 stores online. They can help you when you buy all sorts of products, tech, fashion, everyday products, even food delivery. It's very easy to use. You just install its web browser app. I was able to do that myself. And you can go shopping on your favorite websites like you normally do. And when it comes time to check out, Honey shows up. Yes, it does. And it helps you. You activate Honey and just wait a couple of seconds for it to search for coupons. And if it finds one, you just watch the prices drop. To date, Honey has saved over $2 billion for over 17 million users, and I'm one of them. I've done it on a couple of occasions, and Honey showed up with a few coupons, and sometimes as many as five, and it whips through them, and sometimes its coupon is better than what I'm being offered by the product itself. So if you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out on free savings. It's free and installs in seconds. Using it not only helps you, but it supports this podcast. 
Oh, and I know you want to do that. <laughs> Get Honey for free at www.joinhoney.com slash Lewis. That's L-E-W-I-S. That's joinhoney.com slash Lewis. We are in Reno, Nevada, coming to you live from the Grand Sierra Resort. Um, I've had the pleasure of working here and for a number of years. I've, I started in... Uh, my, my first performances in Reno were years ago, and it was, uh, I did a, a number of uh, shows at what was originally a Catch a Rising Star. Uh, that, was, that was somewhere, I can't fucking remember where, because uh, that was really when I was drinking, and, uh, and it was great. I've always liked this town, and, uh, uh, and it's always a pleasure to be back. So I'm gonna get right to it. Um, it I want to thank all of you. What, what's interesting, uh, uh, I asked um, for folks to send in um, rants from this area, and it was the least amount of rants I've gotten in years. The, the folks in Reno, are, they are so happy <laughs> that I said, you know, write about anything. Write about what you like, what you don't like, whatever. And they were like, no, I'm, I'm too busy smiling <laughs> to really sit down. But it really was. I was like, wow. It, it, when, when we did it, we, we, we do a thing at the, uh, before we start the show, when people did write in a bunch of stuff. And I'm sorry we can't get to a lot of that. But it was really incredible that it was like, wow, these are the happiest people on earth. There's so little. Just kind of, oh, uh, no, I don't have anything to say. And congratulations to you on that, because it really took a lot of effort for a lot of people just go, fuck it. Congratulations. <laughs> and I mean that. I'm not, I'm, I mean it. At first I was upset, and now I embrace it. <laughs> so this is from Hillary. Uh, she's here tonight. Slow walkers. This casino is fucking full of them. Get the fuck out of the way. <laughs> and good Lord, the people that are walking and out of nowhere stop walking and you almost eat shit because their dumbass stops in the middle of the walkway. Jesus H. Christ. <laughs> I know that one. That's... This is uh, Ben Griffin, also in the audience. I was recently fired from my job as a preschool teacher. <laughs> I'd like to hear that story. And I'm told that I should pursue a career in stand-up comedy instead. <laughs> I can't believe they brought you in the office and we're going to have to let you go, but I really think you should go to an open mic night. <laughs> what the fuck do I do with that kind of guidance? <laughs> you, 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 you know, I'm, I'm almost two years sober. Well, I hate to be the one to tell you. Um, I'm almost two years sober from alcohol, so that's off the fucking table. There's only so much acid and weed you can do before you start to forget that real life makes you hallucinate too. <laughs> you're quickly reminded in the preschool classroom when you're asked out of pocket shit like, why are you a boy? <laughs> Talk about some nights of staring into the ether. Anyway. What would you recommend for someone who has patience for three-year-olds, but whose temperament with adults has caused his own mother to call him joyless? <laughs> Sincerely, the Mariners fan in row J. And you're a Mariners fan. Whoo, that is joyless. Well, I, I really don't know what to say, except maybe um, open the first comedy club for three-year-olds. I think that's the way you go. And I don't even think, it, I think you'll fucking make some money. All parents want, really at this point in time, is some other place that they can fucking get the fuckers out so that they could shop for a while. Set it up right next, there's so many fucking of these kind of places that are right next to a, uh, uh, you know, a place you can, you know, you get your, next to a grocery store. Find a, like a little place where you can get some room in the back, seat 50 or 60 kids there, and, and do your show. You know, you don't have to teach them shit, you just want some laughs, that's all. 
You know, that may be the way to go. And if you do it, I can guarantee you this, you'll fucking get press. Then you teach others to do it. Then you got a fucking franchise. Fuck, I've made you a fortune right now. <laughs> this is from Patrick Campbell. As a younger fan of yours, uh, which would mean you're 70. Uh, no, I'm glad. I'm, I'm, I'm doing everything I can to get a younger audience again because it's uh, the, um, people don't realize that I'm on The Daily Show and a whole different group is watching it. Um, as a younger fan of yours and a fan of stand-up comedy in general, I often find that no matter the time period, aside from tone, the subject matter is always the same. The police? I never talked about police. Did I? No, I did not, Patrick. Nope. Uh, politicians, a little. Could have done more. I don't. Um, fast food? Never. Never. Uh-uh. Mm-mm. Uh, can you offer any words of hope that change is possible? Perhaps just add to the fire of impending doom. If that's too much, I'd love to hear you say some kind words about your father. Well, he was a terrific man and, uh, and sadly passed away a few years ago because uh, uh, my mother was really pissed because she kept, she keeps saying at 103, he dies at 101 and she said, he said he was going to live longer. I'm going, holy fuck. <laughs> if that's even more too much, what's your favorite flower? Patrick, there's only so far I'll go. <laughs> I will tell you, I will tell you things will get better. I know that. I know that we're, we're in a period of profound stupidity, and we've been through it before. We're back to where I was when I was 12. That's, this is the way that things are going right now. When I was 12 years old, this is the way the world was in this country. This is the insanity that was going on. And now we will get through it, and uh, a lot of things that will help is a lot of the assholes will pass away. <laughs> yep. And a lot of them are my age. This is from Tim Selane, Cars for Kids theme song. Kill it! And absolutely right. And those of you who don't know that, I don't know how you fucking have missed it. Okay? It's on every fucking morning, fucking nattering, fucking, and they, they don't stop it. And I'm never giving a kid, I'm never getting, I'm not, fuck, they're, they're not getting a car. Not with that fucking song, fuck you. Scott McFarlane, I believe a minimum IQ should be required before you can serve in public office. Not looking for a genius, just something above drooling idiot. <laughs> of course, we vote for the drooling idiot, so maybe there should be a minimum IQ for voters. I got two more to read. Both, uh, both are really, <laughs> I'm, I'm pleased with both of these. They're both uh, ones that I wanted to read because you guys didn't come to play. <laughs> I get to read them, which is great. No, you'll like these. So this is from Martha Eller. So today I was called an old lady by a 20-something. At first I thought they were talking to someone behind me, but then I turned around, no one was there. <laughs> old lady? I'm 45. Exactly 20 years older than this person. Do they not realize that I too was that age once and mentally still am? Do they not realize that if they bought a house tomorrow, they would be older than me when they fucking pay it off? I mean, what the fuck? I'm not even old enough for the senior discount yet. And yet, because of my hair, I am given it without even showing ID. But that's beside the point. I've lived a lot of life in these short 45 years, none of which has been processed by my brain into old lady. I didn't bother to school the young whippersnapper. No, but, well, that's, uh, no, you shouldn't have said that. <laughs> you, you put yourself up there, boy. I, I didn't bother to school the young whippersnapper about ageism or the like. I just kept it moving. I'll be laughing all the way home from Dunkin' Donuts tomorrow with that extra 10 cents I have in my pocket from the senior discount I didn't ask for. 
I'll relish it while I'm thinking of that poor kid who thinks 45 years is old. You see, I could potentially be around to witness some now 20-something being called old. I'll only be 65 then. 20 years of senior discounts may make me richer by then, and I'll be able to make it rain nickels. <laughs> Five cents for every cup of coffee, and believe me, youngster, I can drink a lot of it. No, I refuse to go lightly into this thing called aging. I refuse to let 20-somethings push me toward it faster than I'm ready. I may have white hair, but can you dye yours without bleaching it first, young one, huh? I think not. I'm not old until I say I am. Find another identifier. I'll rant about that one, too, because there's nothing wrong with simply saying that person. But the reality is, young whippersnapper, <laughs> I'll be here to explain that first ache or pain. I'll be here to tell you it will only get worse. So take care of yourself now, so that screech when your engine light comes on isn't so scary. <laughs> Us old ladies will know what you're going through. I'll be fine, but it will also be none of my business. <laughs> Todd sent this in. Uh, Todd sent in this uh, two week, weeks ago, and uh, he, read, I, he, he wrote these things, and he stopped. He, he didn't go into what I thought he should talk about. And I said, please write about this, and don't write about this other stuff, because once I read this, I had no interest in the rest of it. And he sent it in, and lucky for us, he did. This is Todd. My name is Todd. I've been a commercial pilot for 32 years. About 15 years ago, I was captain flying for an airline which will remain at Northwest. <laughs> On a quick turn flight through Detroit, we offloaded passengers, ground crews started cleaning, restocking, fueling, and I ran up the jet bridge to the gate agent desk to retrieve our paperwork, flight plan, load manifest, etc. The gate agent informed me we had a full flight and three wheelchair passengers, one being a quadriplegic with a service monkey. Dun, 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 dun. Which will take extra time to board, so she wanted to send them down right away. I noticed the wheelchair passengers already lined up next to the door, and one with a cute little tan and black diapered monkey in his lap. I agreed with the gate agent and ran back down to inform the flight aid attendants that they were coming. Foreshadowing, but no pun intended. After running our pre-flight checklist and about halfway through the boarding process, my lead flight attendant burst into the cockpit and shut the door behind her. She was half doubled over, gasping for air, red-faced and crying. I thought, my God, is she choking or perhaps she's just been assaulted? I jumped up next to her, asking if she was okay. She was snorting uncontrollably, tears running down her face till she, till she was unable to breathe, but she nodded. It was then that I realized she wasn't injured, but was convulsing in debilitating fits of laughter. Still not completely convinced she was all right, I said, what's wrong? Between snorts and gulps of airs, the only word she could utter was, look, as she pointed to the cabin through the cockpit door. I cracked the door open and peered past the parade of still boarding passengers who were being unofficially greeted by the service monkey sitting on the right shoulder of the man in 2C. There sat the little black and tan monkey who liberated itself from his oppressive diaper. <laughs> Facing forward, legs spread, screeching gleefully with the ear-piercing pitch and volume of a malfunctioning smoke detector. And like a furry little jackhammer was whacking away at his tiny primate penis. <laughs> I shut the door and felt my lungs nearly collapsed. I left so hard I thought I was gonna black out or have a stroke. I had nothing but compassion for the humili humiliated man, but that was the funniest shit I'd ever seen. <laughs> After composing ourselves to a point we could function, the flight attendant returned to finish loading, and I had to convince myself what I had just seen was real. 
I have to make clear, I'm not mocking the disabled man. He couldn't even lift his arm to swap the little fucker off his shoulder. <laughs> All he could do and did was turn his head and blow puffs of air toward the masturbating monkey, which I can only guess was an attempt either to deter the monkey from spanking it or accelerate the process. <laughs> sure which. <laughs> With our jobs to do, we pushed back from the gate and departed, trying very hard to stay focused. Halfway through the fight, the lead attendant called the cockpit on the telephone, again dying with laughter. All I could make out were a muffled gasp, but he's doing it again. <laughs> I told her to offer the monkey a bag of peanuts. <laughs> she lost it and hung up. A good flight attendant will serve you drinks and save your ass in an emergency. A great flight attendant will do that and help you diaper a horny monkey. <laughs> Shout out to all the great flight attendants. You know who you are. Thank you, Todd. I thought you'd like that one. We are coming to you live from Monterey, California. We're at the Golden State Theater. If you've not been to Monterey, it is... Uh, it, someone just pointed out that it was uh, California's first capital. And that, and that obviously has gotten three people excited. <laughs> and, uh, they're fighting to bring it back here. Uh, <laughs> they, they came in tonight thinking that was a meeting for this. <laughs> and, it, and then things went awry. <laughs> but thank you for pointing that out. I, I uh, really, I didn't care. <laughs> um, what I was going to say was is that uh, it's, a, it's really, a, it's an absolutely stunning spot to visit. And it's one of these places where people go to, people go to Europe and come back and go, oh, I've, I went to this place. It was fucking, I mean, we just wandered down the shore and it was, it was this beautiful spot. That's, this is, the, this is that, this is what Monterey is. You know, it's, I, I couldn't live here. I, I, I would, whew. this place is so nice, I'd kill myself. <laughs> I would, and, I, and I, I mean that in an affectionate way. I, it really is, it's just, it's, it, bucolic is a word that comes up. It's just really, it's, it's really, and it's why it couldn't be the capital, because who'd get anything done? They'd just get up and go, uh, you know, I'm gonna go look at the seals. But I'm telling you, if you get to, if you get to California, this is one of the spots you should visit, and uh, absolutely, it's, it's, uh, you're gonna be glad you did. If you can't get to Europe, you know, come here. And they speak a kind of English. <laughs> and so we're reading a lot of the stuff came in tonight that, uh, what's interesting is tonight and, and last night in Reno, uh, no one from Reno sent in any rants before I arrived. Tonight in Monterey, not a, not one, no one in my, and that's because oh, the, these people are so, they are so content. They are so happy with everything that's going on that they went, you know, can you send in something that upsets you? And they went, uh, uh, no, I really can't. I, I tried to think of something and then, well, it, it made me want a nap. Uh. So we'll start with the Gregory Corliss. What the fuck? I've been waiting for months to re-up on my Lewis Black merch, and I get here and there's a poster of you where the merch table used to be. <laughs> it tells me to go to the fucking website to buy it. I don't buy this crap to remember going to the fucking website. I buy it to memori 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 memorialize my presence at the goddamn show, you idiot. Now I'm just fucking stuck here in the back of the fucking theater with my shitty old worn out Lewis Black sweatshirt and hat. My life has lost all meaning. Wait, I, 
if I'd known that. I'm, I'm going to have to acquiesce and buy crap online with no, no love or attachment to it. I guess I can let my cat sleep on it. We haven't, we haven't gotten back to having somebody, a merch table out there, and I don't do the meet and greets yet until we get through this, whatever this phase is, and then eventually we, we will do it again. I just, uh, you know, it's, it, it's just, um, I'm still uh, a little dingy from going through the four years of it, and to add, to add that is, is a little much at this point, but eventually we'll get to that, and, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm, you know, you'll like it. They, it comes in a really beautiful uh, uh, post office box. <laughs> it's really special. I think it, you, you may decide to buy everything online. You, you do Amazon, fuck. <laughs> no, I am sorry. It's, uh, it's all we can do at this point. So, Tahia Marome, I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. All the dumb fucks who say stupid shit like securing drinkable water or healthy soil or breathable air is not doable because it costs too much. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> it doesn't cost too much. It's water, you mentally denuded glob of corpuscles. Even if it costs everything, it's not too much. It's goddamn fucking water. It's freaking air. It's the soil that literally turns into the cells that make up your literal waste of a body. Wow, and that's what she had to say. <laughs> Boy, when they're mad here, they do get mad. This is uh, Missy B. Monterey Bay Cal Calamari is the best. Yeah, why the fuck do fancy restaurants in Monterey serve calamari monster fat steaks frozen from the Philippines? <laughs> Pisses me off a little every time I see it. Just saying. I think it's probably because it's cheaper. <laughs> you know, I would try to find out, Missy, where they're shipping it to, and you may want to go eat there. It's probably well, six states away. Is it really that good? Well, how do you know if you can't, if you're fucking forced to eat the fucking fatty, fat fucking shit from the Philippines? There's special places, there's some sort of underground, some sort of bootleg calamari business. <laughs> this is Jody Marie, 38 year old female fire captain making six figures and can't afford to buy a house in Monterey, the town I work in. That sucks. That's really, uh, that's, a, that's really, a, it's crazy what goes on now. It's the same in New York. They're, they're, you know, they want cops to live in New York, but then the cops can't afford to live in New York City. So it's like lunacy. It doesn't make sense. It really needs to be dealt with on, you know, it, it's, you're part of the community. And then it's like, no, well, you know, could you live three, you know, what about, could you take a 45 minute commute to get here? Well, it's fucking, this is, this, that is the, this is an expensive town. That's another reason I, you guys pay it, but, but you're paying for all that stuff. And, and you, I think you should get Jody a place to stay. Huh? Oklahoma. O Oklahoma? That's, it, no. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a good musical. And my father went to the University of Oklahoma and I never thought it would be such a topic of discussion this evening. She's also pissed about people who honk in tunnels if they have a lower IQ. <laughs> this is from Jonah Jameson. Jonah, a girlfriend asked me if I wanted to see an old comedian that complains a lot in a rundown theater. I said, uh, I don't care much for Larry David, but if the tickets are cheap, sure. <laughs> it's, it's very sweet of you, Jonah. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> and I'm going to leave you with this. This is one of the most uh, astonishingly, uh, I've never seen anything like this. I did not think I would read it. Um, and it's, it's about instructions about how to knit a sweater. 
Yeah. Audrey Lintner has written this. She's written some other things, as I remember. Dear knitwear designer, since you, your test knitters, and your tech editor were all drunk, stoned, pissed at the world when this pattern came to be, I have a few questions regarding the construction and assembly of what is supposed to be a clever pattern. Why do you tell me to bind off the shoulder stitches on one page and then tell me on the next to join said shoulders with a three needle bind off? I'm currently thinking of another use for that third needle and it has nothing to do with your shoulders. Am I supposed to leave the neckline stitches on a holder for all eternity? I followed the directions and put them on the holder, but you never refer to them again, ever. My kid is not going to like having a cold metal stitch holder against the back of his neck every time he wears his sweater. And I'm not gonna be pleased to have rust marks leaking down the back of his collar after a few weeks. After walking through a garbled, but somehow very detailed description of how to assemble the sweater, minus the damn neckline, and explaining that it should now look like something that might reasonably fit an average small human, you go on to say that, oh yeah, the individual sweater pieces should have been washed before assembly. This is an important piece of information for people who make the mistake of thinking that a pattern will have some sort of logical progression. They may dive right in and end up drinking heavily or freebasing Godiva syrup. <laughs> so in yarn tails, a long neck to form an even V-neck wedge. What the actual flying fuck does that even mean? What yarn tails? The magic tails that sprouted from the not gonna happen three needle bind off? The tails still attached to the ball of yarn at one end and the next stitch is at the other because you said to put them on a holder and never said to cut them off or how long to leave them? Is there a picture of this neck sewing process? Which sounds kind of painful or is it just an idea that popped out of your last colonoscopy? I'm gonna rewrite this pattern so that my kid will have a nice sweater rather than a swearing, crying mother crouched in a corner surrounded by empty chocolate wrappers and K-cups. <laughs> Sincerely, I hope your toilet paper has splinters. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Look, relationships take work, and a lot of us will drop anything to go help someone we care about. We go out of our way to treat other people, but how often do we give ourselves the same treatment? It's important to invest in yourself. This month, BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you to take care of your most important relationship, the one you have with yourself. Take time for yourself to go to the gym, get that haircut, and yes, try therapy. You are your greatest asset, so invest the time and effort into yourself like you do for other people. As someone who's been in therapy for a long time, I myself see the benefits of prioritizing self-care. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try and see why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp Online Therapy. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Rantcast listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Rantcast. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash Rantcast. We're coming to you tonight from the Turlock Community Theater in, in Turlock, California. Um, it has uh, truly been a, a, a great evening here because apparently no one has ever come here. <laughs> As a performer, you wait for nights like this when the, the audience is really overstimulated because they went, somebody came, somebody fucking found us. <laughs> apparently there's a contest every year um, if you can find Turlock, uh, the first one who does gets a million dollars. You just have to find the person who has the million. But it's well worth, uh, it's well worth a visit just to see what's not here. But I, the, the people are really charming, because uh, I guess they've got to be, because they're, 
it's it's kind of a I don't I don't really I just you come here and you tell me <laughs> because I'm getting out of here as soon as possible. <laughs> no, not that I. I just don't know where to go. It, you know, you kind of drive around a town. You go where where? Um, but uh, I'm just going to uh, if I if I wasn't going to Napa tomorrow, if I didn't hear wine calling, ar, 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 I wouldn't be going. So. Uh, but it's been a pleasure, and the audience has been really terrific tonight, so I'd like to thank them. <laughs> and to give you a sense that I'm not being fucking with them, this is, the first one of these from them comes from John Lovett. How the hell did you get stuck in Turlock? <laughs> was, was Podunk the fuck Idaho booked? <laughs> being a teenager, it's a dumpster fire of fuckery. That's from Carter Lucas. You're absolutely right, Carter. And well put. No, you, you really are fucked. I'm serious, I don't know how you deal with it. There are no adults in the room, none. You just look at Congress, I mean, and you must be just like going, holy fuck. It really is, it's like when, uh, when they announced how to deal with the pandemic. It was like when I was a kid in elementary school and they said, in case of a nuclear attack, get under your desk. <laughs> and I said, why? And they said, because you'll burn faster. <laughs> I really wish you nothing but the best, Carter. I, I think this too shall pass, and I think in the end, your generation will be better off for it and more empathetic because of it, and you may be better adults. God, I hope so. Um, and, and speaking of better adults, David Bella says, wonder what you think of Donald Trump's children. <laughs> and that's all I have to say. <laughs> I, I don't think of them. That's one of the great joys of my life. You go, would I like to think about, no. And from anon anon, being gay is really expensive. It takes a lot of money to look this gay. I, I think that was much funnier than you did. That was seriously fucking funny. You are getting a C as an audience reaction. I think you didn't laugh because you went, I don't know if that was really a gay person saying that, or is it someone who's just making fun of gay? Who, uh, this is fucking funny. No matter who wrote it, there was too much thought going on in this crowd. I think you've, you've had, to, this is, God damn it. And it's true. It does take a lot of money to look this gay. Sorry, well done and on and on. And that's why it's a non and on. Son of a bitch, people. But it's okay. Don't repeat that to anyone. If you didn't laugh, you fucking shut up. You don't get to say it to anybody tomorrow. You just keep it to yourself. Son of a bitch. Wasn't that irritating? Yeah, yeah he got it. This is from David Herlock, which I don't think is his real name, for the Turlock show. <laughs> That can't be, it, and this is, these are quite wonderful. During a summer drought, I don't always water my lawn or mow the grass when it gets too tall to save the environment. Yet, according to my neighbors, I'm the asshole. <laughs> California, this state is so big that if I had a nickel for every time I watched a news story and said, where the hell is that town? I'd have enough money to feed a homeless person. We loosened up a little, didn't we, huh? <laughs> Turlock, a small town where you can live one mile away from the hospital you were born and one mile away from the cemetery you'll be buried in. That's true. I, I pretty much got it. <laughs> that kind of rousing applause. Turlock, this town accidentally overbuilt so many churches, it's an oversight not even Jesus would forgive. <laughs> uh, 
And then finally, Turlock, this is good, the best place to watch a comedian's career die. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David Herlock. David Herlock from Turlock. Oh, man. And this is really when, when you know, you, you, when you're feeling, boy, Turlock, this, this will put it in perspective. This comes from Karen Black. I am an old single woman. Seven years ago, I moved from the high plains of New Mexico, also known as the dark side of the moon, to a temperate rainforest also known as the Appalachian Mountains, or deliverance country. <laughs> I traded 17 years of flat, hot, dry, and brown for hills, cool, rain, and green. I found 3.5 acres of land I could afford on the side of a mountain, designed and had built a tiny house. I love it. I'm surrounded by tall, coniferous, and deciduous trees, a mostly gentle, temperate climate, all sorts of wildlife, purple mountain vistas. It is drop-dead gorgeous. My issue is the hominids, who are also my neighbors. We are talking fucking gun-toting, Confederate flag-waving, knuckle-dragging nitwits. The, the five, and usually I kind of go, oh, well, that's a little much weight. The five male fat asses who live down the mountain and across the road from me run out of their hovel once per week shirtless in fucking January and shoot off their fucking rifles for no discernible reason whatsoever. My first day here, one of them waddled up to me and asked, this is really, I can all shoot me all the whistle pigs I want? I had to ask him to slowly repeat his request about six times before I was able to deduce the question, which was, can I shoot all of the groundhogs I want? He meant on my land. I said, first of all, who the fuck are you? <laughs> Second, what the fuck is a whistle pig? And third, if it means you want to trespass on my land and shoot something, then no! He spat out a wad of tobacco the size of a hockey puck, nearly missing my foot, and said, that's too bad, them's good eating. <laughs> I took this as a veiled threat. So I said by way of explanation, my dog will try to kill you, true. Then you will have to shoot my dog, who is like my son. Then I will have to shoot you and either get killed, adopting the local vernacular, <laughs> or go to prison. Eventually, he came to agree with me that this was probably not a wholly desirable outcome. A bit later, I was approached by a cousin of the before-mentioned fuckhead. They're all related. Who drove his rattle-trap vehicle up my long drive. He looked like a Duck Dynasty reject. He had on the full red scraggly beard down to his belted coveralls, a cap like an old-time train engineer, and small round black-rimmed glasses. Without getting out of his car, he leaned out the window and actually asked me, are you looking to get married? Or are you one of them lesbos? It was very like one of those moments you describe as what it feels like to have a brain aneurysm. Resorting again to the local vernacular, I was totally bum-fuzzled. I'm not a person who is normally at a loss for words, but I felt as though I'd been smacked across the chops with a large dead fish. Recovering somewhat, I asked, are these my only two choices? How about I'm just a person who prefers to be left the fuck alone? As he was turning around his vehicle, I heard him mumble under his breath, Lesbo. A bit after this, I met a woman who lives down the road a piece from me. She's in her 50s now, but she tells me she was married at the age of 12. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Her father traded. Oh, my God. This is really, it's staggering. You are going to, you will sleep better tonight because of this. Her father traded her for a squirrel rifle and a jug of hooch. She'd only recently acquired indoor plumbing, of which she was enormously proud. 
You think you are living in fictional times? I am living in a rerun of the Dukes of Hazard. Every time I step out my door, I can hear the strains of the Deliverance song playing in my head. All of this was semi-scary to semi-humorous. Then Trump somehow got his lame orange ass elected president. Now it's just full on scary as shit. Thank you, Karen Black. I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. It was a pleasure spending time with you in Turlock. I will tell my friends to come visit you. We'll see you all next week. Tune us in. We'll be in Napa and Lolita and um, uh, Redding, California. So send in your rants. Thank you very much, guys. Take care of each other. Good night. Thanks to all of you for listening to my rant cast. If you have a rant you want to get off your chest, send it in to me at lewisblack.com forward slash live. You can think of it as therapy or whatever you want to think of it as. Just let it rip. And I want to thank the true stars of our show, the ranters and the splendid rants they gave us. Lewis Black's Rantcast was created and hosted by me, Haha, <laughs> Lewis Black. It is produced by James Salkind. Our theme song by Chris Lane. Executive producer, Ben Brewer. Executive producers, Matt Kleinschmidt and Robert Kelly for the Laugh Button Podcast. And most of all, thank you, all of you who ranted so well on this show. <laughs>